Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. I uh, had a, uh, a listener that tweeted about a link to the story of Michelle Obama hosting the Hindu Festival for the Goddess of Wealth, inviting demons into the White House. You can go to cnsnews.com and find that story. C as in Charlie, N as in November, S as in Sierra, cnsnews.com. And you can read all about it. Michelle Obama hosting the Hindu festival for the goddess of wealth uh, at uh, the White House. Now, a triple eight five eight nine eight eight four zero number to call. You know, it's been interesting to. I haven't talked about this this dust up over the name Redskins. President Obama saying it's offensive. It ought to be changed. It's racist. It's insulting. Blah blah blah. So President Obama has officially taken sides on the Redskins uh, controversy. And I want to just give you a little bit of information about this. Uh, number one, yesterday, President Obama had the Stanley Cup champions. This is the team that won the National Hockey League Stanley Cup. That's their version of the World Series, their version of the Super Bowl. He had them in the White House. They are the Chicago Blackhawks. Blackhawks, that's Indian. That's an Indian name. In fact, their mascot is Tommy Hawk. Get it? Tomahawk, Tommy Hawk, that's their mascot. He's on their logo. He's a cartoon bird, and he's got an Indian chief on the front of his jersey with, with the, the, the war headdress on. So apparently for President Obama, there's something insulting about Redskins, but um, Blackhawks is an absolutely most excellent mascot to have. Now, the Washington Post in the last year has written 32,000 words trying to get the Washington Redskins to change the name of their mascot. 32,000 word campaign from October 2012 to October 2013. 31,562 print words to the crusade. That is just about the same number of words in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, and it's seven times longer than the United States Constitution. Now, what you may not know is the history behind the name of the Washington Redskins. And by the way, last time a survey was done, only 11, only 10% of Native Americans are offended by the term Redskins. 10%. 11% of Americans are offended by it, but only 10% of Native Americans are offended by it. Uh, so this this is obviously just an expression of white guilt, white arrogance, white supremacy. Now, here's the history behind the name, the Washington Redskins. Uh, and, and by the way, Kingston, Oklahoma High School is 58% Native American. This is a high school in Kingston, Oklahoma, probably Cherokee. I've got some Cherokee blood in me. My roots go back to Oklahoma. So Kingston, Oklahoma High School, 58% Native American. You know what the name of their teams are? They are the Redskins. They have been the Redskins for 104 years. Now, how did Washington, the NFL franchise, get the name Redskins? Listen to this. When they started, the doesn't say what the name of the team was. It was under the leadership of George Preston Marshall. They started in 1932 and moved to Fenway Park. So apparently the Redskins started playing their football games in Fenway Park under the leadership of George Preston Marshall. The very next year, Marshall changed the name to Redskins. Why? Because the coach of the Washington Redskins was Lone Star Dietz, who was an American Sioux. He was a Sioux Indian. And to honor the Sioux, the Native American, the Indian coach of his NFL franchise, he changed the name to Redskins to honor the coach of the team. So it was a tribute to a coach that he uh, believed in. Looking at a story here about the Croatan Indians, uh, they believe this is a tribe of 1,200 members and uh, they believe that the Washington Redskins ought to keep the, the term. Uh, one of them says he is not offended by the term Redskins used as the name of a professional team. They are warriors and survivors. It's a great name 
for a team. So that's a little bit of backstory on the Washington Redskins issue. Let's grab a couple of phone calls. Well, it's uh, 888 888 is the number to call. Before we grab the phone calls, let's grab a couple of sound bites. Now let's grab uh, clip number four, getting back to the Obamacare issue for a moment. Now, remember, but President Obama, giving out the 800 number. Hey, look, if you can't get online, don't worry about it. Number to call again, 888 If you can't get online, don't worry about it because you can call this 800 number and you can fill out the paper application. You can get the whole thing done in 25 minutes. Now, Jonathan Carl says, hey, look, that's a lie. That's another lie. Because once that paperwork is filled out, you still have to go to the same website. I mean, that navigator still has to go to the same website that you can't get on to put your information in online. So it doesn't save time at all. That's not a faster process. Everybody's stuck in the same queue. So here's John Carl having a little back and forth with Jay Carney about another lie that the Obama administration is telling. Let's listen. I want to go back to exactly what the president said. He said you can bypass the website and apply by phone or in person, and then it can be done in 25 minutes. But these memos say that at the end of the day, we are all stuck in the same queue because they all have to go through the same portal. John, I get it. But the person who calls isn't the one who continues to wait after the paper application is filled. Uh, you, you, right? your, your mocking is entertaining, but the president said that we, you could apply within 25 minutes. That's that right. was not true. The work that you do, I think everybody else is looking quizzically because there's a reason to be quizzical here. You call up. You, you give your information, you get the questions answered that you need answered, and then it's, they take over from there. And then you find out, you know, what you're eligible for, uh, and the process right. goes forward. Once 25 you're, minutes? No, once your process, you know, once your application is processed. The point was to relieve some of the frustration that Americans were understandably experiencing. So John Carl says, look, the president said, hey, you can, you can uh, enroll in 25 minutes by going to this phone number online. And uh, the process goes forward. And John Carl says, in 25 minutes, and Jay Carney says, no. But once your application is processed, then it'll work. Now, jump down to clip number seven. This is an excerpt from an ABC News story. We brought you this guy before who tried to enroll in Obamacare on, on the phone because he couldn't get on online. Here's ABC News now. So you got John Carl, ABC News, saying, hey, I thought the president said you could enroll in 25 minutes. Jay Carney says, no, nah, actually, you can fill out the paperwork. But then everybody's stuck in the same online queue as everybody else. So here's John Carl following up about the guy that's been trying to enroll on, uh, on the phone. That's not how it worked for Georgia resident Robert Schlora. We visited him the day the president gave out that phone number. After failing online, he tried the hotline. I really have no idea whether or not I'll be offered a better plan, whether or not the government will help me subsidize it. We contacted Mr. Schlora again today, and after two weeks and several calls to that hotline, he still has not been able to enroll in a new health plan. As for the overall numbers, Diane, the White House still won't tell us how many people have enrolled online or over the phone. They say that those numbers will be coming in about two weeks. It <laughs> oh, man. So it wasn't 25 minutes for him. It's 25 minutes going on two weeks, going on two months. Now, one last clip before we go to the phones. Grab clip number six, President Obama, on people having their insurance plans canceled. Let's listen. We did this to put an end to the days when the individual market had almost no standards. When every year thousands of Americans would be dropped from their coverage. People are acting like this is some new phenomenon. Every year there was churn in this individual market. The average increase was double digits on premiums in this same market. With or without affordable, uh, the Affordable Care Act. People were getting, oftentimes, a very bad deal. Now, so he says, look, people are acting like this is a new phenomenon. And he says thousands of people. Every year lose their insurance. We're not talking about thousands of people, Mr. President. We are talking about 129 million. This is, in fact, a new phenomenon. We have never seen anything like this in the history of the American healthcare industry. Let's grab a couple of phone calls before we're done. Let's go to Harry in uh, Tupelo, Mississippi. Harry, welcome. What's on your mind? Hi, I, I love the show first and foremost, sir. Um, Th thank you. I wanted to uh, let your listeners listen know, just in case, because uh, I haven't heard anybody talk about this, but in 2018, there's a little snippet in the health care law 
uh, where they dump it as a Cadillac tax. Yes. If that insurance plan offers better insurance than what through Obamacare, they're going to tax you more for it. Yeah. And it, it's basically, uh, it's basically uh, just for the employer to go to a single, uh, you know, to drop an employee and go to that exchange system. That's how the tax is. Yeah. All right, Barry. Listen, Harry. I appreciate the call. I'm gonna. Well, I have to let you go because we got kind of a bad connection here. But Harry's exactly right. There's a Cadillac plan tax goes into effect in 2018. The unions were completely bent out of shape over that because every one of their plans is a Cadillac t- plan, according to President Obama. And the unions were going to get soaked to the gills by this thing. That's why President Obama has given them a waiver and a pass that nobody else uh, gets in the program. Last call of the day. Let's go to Ray, Tampa, Florida. Ray, welcome to Focal Point. What's on your mind? Praise God, Brian. Hey, listen, man, just really cut to the chase. I know we're really late, but I just want to say I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray every day for our government, for our president. However, here's what the Lord told me. He wants to take our government into Muslim and to make a Muslim nation out of it. He wants to make it a caliphate, Sharia law, and that's his goal. He's got an agenda, and Satan's using him to bring in the Antichrist. I really believe that with my whole heart. Hmm. Well, you know, and what the larger agenda is, you know, it can be hard to say, but I will say that his administration has been infiltrated by the Muslim Brotherhood. He supports the Muslim Brotherhood. Everywhere he takes actions overseas is to support the Islamic movement toward uh, toward a global caliphate. I agree with Ray. I think this is his agenda. His sympathy is with Islam. He would actually like to see an Islamic caliphate over the entire world. That's why we need to stay in prayer. Bow low before God, stand tall before man, stand in the gap. Never forget, we're fighting a winnable war. See you tomorrow. The views and opinions.